Jonathan Pollard, competition lawyer for Lauderdale, Florida. Today's topic is the trade secret smear campaign. America is in the midst of an epidemic of frivolous trade secret litigation. Everywhere you look, big companies are filing trade secret lawsuits not intended to protect their actual trade secrets, but instead intended to eliminate and suppress ordinary competition. So let's start by talking about trade secrets, okay? If you go back historically, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago, the concept of a trade secret was intended to protect companies that had developed a very high level of confidential proprietary information that was truly unique to the company, not available to competitors in the marketplace, highly valuable, and would allow for unfair competition by a competitor if it were to be misappropriated. That is the legal foundational framework for what a trade secret is supposed to be. The problem is that courts and the case law and corporate lawyers have not kept up with the facts. They have not kept up with the market realities because the world has changed. What may have constituted a trade secret in 1975 or even 1995 can hardly be said to constitute a trade secret today in 2020. In fact, many corporate or management side lawyers who filed these types of bad faith trade secret cases, um, they routinely act as if the internet does not exist and as if Google is not a real thing. I have been involved in countless trade secret cases defending these cases where the allegations against my client were nothing short of absurd. One of the best examples I can give is a case where the central claimed trade secret was their so-called customer list and customer information. Folks, I see this all the time where the corporate plaintiff, the corporate bad actor puts at issue the customers, the customer list, the customer information. And when you dig further into this, come to find out the customers are all publicly available. You can go on Google and identify who they are. You can go on LinkedIn and find the decision makers. Maybe these types of things were trade secrets 40 years ago, but they certainly do not constitute trade secrets in the year 2020. So you see companies in the corporate playbook for suppressing ordinary competition. If there's an employee who leaves and starts a business, if there's an employee who leaves and goes to a competitor, if there's a startup company, if there's a new market rival, corporate playbook 101 for suppressing fair and ordinary competition and protecting your market share is to sue that market actor or market entrant for theft of trade secrets. You just have to get a hook for it. That's what these companies do. That's what these management side corporate lawyers do. They're just looking for that hook. And the hook can be the new company hired somebody from the dominant market actor, or even more nefarious, the hook can be the dominant market actor, the bad actor here, the corporate plaintiff, goes and enters into talks with the new market entrant, with the startup company, about a possible acquisition or joint venture or some kind of collaboration, get them to sign an NDA and then turn around and say, no, no deal, we've decided not to move forward with it, but by the way, we see you're doing very well right now and you know we assume you stole some of our trade secrets, so we're just gonna file this lawsuit against you. That's what bad corporate actors do, it is 101 in the corporate playbook. And, and why do they do this? Well, for one thing, they can cause their rival, they can cause the new market entrant tremendous costs to defend themselves in the litigation. Just the sheer cost of paying for attorney's fees to litigate a case of this nature can easily enter into the range of several hundred thousand, if not multiple millions of dollars. If we're talking about sort of a truly 
high stakes, complex trade secret dispute, it's not uncommon for these cases to cost a million dollars in fees to defend oneself, let alone the costs of document review, document collection, production, forensics, expert witnesses, etc. So the costs can become astronomical very quickly. Not only are there the litigation costs, not only is there a sort of perceived benefit from a standpoint of raising rivals' costs, there is also the opportunity for the dominant market actor to use a bad faith trade secret case to actually steal the trade secrets of the other company through discovery. That happens all the time. Beyond that, they can use the litigation as part of running the trade secret smear campaign. Now we get into the actual smear campaign. It's not enough for these companies, for these corporate bad actors, simply to file a bogus theft of trade secrets lawsuit, to raise their rivals' costs, to make them spend all of this money on, on litigation fees and expenses, to subject their documents, their information, their trade secrets to potential misappropriation through the discovery process. No, no, no. That's not enough for these corporate bad actors. What they're going to do, and I've seen this dozens if not hundreds of times, what they're going to do is they're going to go to all of the relevant counterparties in the market, whether it's the customers, the clients, the suppliers, the investors, whoever it is that has an interest in this space, who they want to stay aligned with and who they want to block the new company from engaging with, the bad corporate actor is going to go to all of these folks or the most important among these folks and they're going to run the smear campaign. They're going to say, <clears throat> hey, you know, I just wanna let you know, um, we're now in litigation with company X because company X stole our trade secrets. So, you know, FYI, there's probably gonna be a criminal investigation and, you know, we really don't want you to get dragged into this case and we don't wanna create any sort of headaches for you. So for the foreseeable future, you know, it'll probably just be best if you steer clear of company X until all of this is, you know, resolved, right? I see that happen time and time again. I've seen the trade secret smear campaign not only um, limited to trade secrets, but it's like, it's like um, the book by Dr. Seuss, right? The Mulberry Street book, okay? First it starts as theft of trade secrets. Then it turns into, oh yeah, they, they didn't just steal our trade secrets. Um, you know, we think they hacked our servers. There's like some espionage, some computer fraud. It spirals out of control. I've seen these things turn into allegations of not only misappropriation of trade secrets, but hacking and unauthorized use of computer systems, criminal conduct of all sorts, theft or um, embezzlement, the list goes on and on and on. It's like you're gonna tell a lie, you tell a big one. So once they start going in the direction of lying about theft of trade secrets, they just add more fuel to the fire to try and convince these counterparties not to do business with company X. This is the paradigmatic trade secret smear campaign, and I've seen it in countless cases. Now, many corporate plaintiffs, the corporate bad actor in this context, and their management side corporate counsel, linger under the delusion that this type of conduct is somehow immune from scrutiny, from liability, or from legal action. And so their favorite argument to make in this context is that yes, they may have gone around and talked to whoever and mentioned the lawsuit, but that this is all part of the litigation process and that conduct is protected by what's called litigation privilege. Folks, litigation privilege, um, particularly in, in, in Florida and I'm sure in other jurisdictions as well, litigation privilege is a poorly understood concept that corporate bad actors are always throwing around, particularly in the context of the trade secret smear campaign. Let me just explain what litigation privilege really entails, okay? Litigation privilege prevents you from being sued 
for taking an action that you had a right to take as part of the litigation process. That is the best formulation of the doctrine by far. Why? Because as many folks know, there's litigation privilege, which is an immunity for those actions, but by the same token, there's also malicious prosecution. If somebody files a bad faith lawsuit maliciously, no basis whatsoever in law or fact, they can get sued for malicious prosecution. So this leads lots of people to say, well, that's, that's incoherent because you can't have on one hand litigation privilege and immunity, and on the other hand, have malicious prosecution. They just cannot be reconciled. Well, they absolutely can be reconciled. They can be reconciled based on the idea of rightful conduct. So, of course, you have a right to file a lawsuit. You have a right to seek discovery, to take people's depositions, to th say things in your pleadings, to say things in, in court, in hearings, to examine witnesses. Sure, you have a right to do all of these things. What you don't have a right to do is to file a malicious bad faith lawsuit. And likewise, what you don't have a right to do is go around to counterparties in the relevant market running a smear campaign. That smear campaign is not an action taken in the course of litigation. In the course of litigation means you filed it in court, you did it in a courtroom, you set it in a deposition. That is the course of litigation. If you just go to a counterparty and call them on the phone or send them a text message and say, hey, by the way, we're suing company X and they stole our trade secrets and they're criminals and you wanna stay away from them, that is not part of the litigation process and you don't have a right to do that. Likewise, sending letters on the front end of litigation, that is not litigation privileged unless it's an action that was necessarily preliminary to the litigation. So if there's a contractual provision or a statutory provision that requires you to, for instance, notify a lender or notify a counterparty or notify an investor about the proceedings, about the allegations, then, then sure, that's necessarily preliminary because it's required by law as part of the litigation process. But if you just go around firing off letters to various counterparties, interested parties, third parties, where you're talking all kinds of smack about what Company X did, and it's ultimately proven to be a lie, that is actionable. So now we move to the arena of what is it actionable as, okay? By far, the best and most powerful claim in this context is a defamation per se claim. Now you have to remember, okay, you have defamation on one hand, you have defamation per se on the other hand. The beauty of a defamation per se claim is that when it's defamation per se, the statement is presumed to be automatically on its face harmful to the plaintiff's reputation, standing in the community, business, trade, profession, what, ha what have you. The statement is so inherently suspect that the jury, and that's ultimately where this goes, unless there's a jury trial waiver, unless it's in arbitration, this is ultimately where, where we're headed with defamation per se. The jury gets to decide what it feels is a reasonable dollar amount to compensate the plaintiff for the defamation per se. So if you are the bad corporate actor and you go around accusing company X of stealing your trade secrets and hacking your computer systems and embezzling funds from you and everything else, and you make up this whole elaborate what I saw on Mulberry Street story, and it comes collapsing down and it is proven at trial that you did this in bad faith solely to suppress competition and solely to harm a market rival, you had no good faith motivation for this whatsoever, you will get whacked and a jury gets to decide what dollar amount to put on that. So if you actually look into the defamation per se case law, you will see incredible jury verdicts. You'll routinely see $5 million, $10 million, $20 million jury verdicts. Why? Because the damages are presumed and the jury gets to put the number on it, but it doesn't stop there. In the context 
of defamation per se in most jurisdictions, you are also entitled not only to presume damages, but also to punitive damages. If you can prove the factual predicate of what we've just been discussing here in this conversation, you will have the foundation for seeking punitive damages. And then those damages will be a function of whatever your presumed damages are. Because some people think, well, they're presumed damages, punitives can't be based on that. No, they absolutely can. Presumed damages are just your sort of baseline compensatory damages. They're presumed, but they're your baseline compensatory damages. And your punitives are gonna be a multiplier of that. So even if you're in a jurisdiction which has a pretty aggressive cap on the type of punitive damages you can recover, let's say it's a three times cap. So here we go. Company X gets a $5 million presumed damages award. Then they seek punitives. They get a three times because it's capped. So that's $15 million right there. We're at $20 million right there. What are the other claims that you can bring in this posture? You can always bring defamation. You can bring tortious interference. You can also attach punitive damages to a tortious interference claim. The defamation per se claim is just the better of the two because of the presumed damages. If you want to get really creative and if the smear campaign was widely disseminated enough, then you can get into things like Lanham Act false advertising. Well, why would you do that? Well, you might do Lanham Act false advertising for two reasons. One, you might do um, false advertising because there's a potential attorney's fees hook. And then number two, more importantly, you might do false advertising because there is actually corrective advertising available as a remedy. So imagine, Company X has gotten dragged through the mud, reputation destroyed by the original plaintiff, the corporate bad actor. It's all a lie. It's bad faith. The corporate bad actor runs the trade secret smear campaign. Company X countersues for all these things, gets $20 million in damages. And then at the end of the day, as an added kicker, the original corporate bad actor has to go around to all of the affected counterparties and tell them, basically, we lied about all this. Company X never stole our trade secrets. Company X never did anything wrong. We're sorry. Just think about what that does to company, to the original corporate bad actors, business, to its revenue, to its reputation, to the willingness of customers and third parties and counterparties to work with them. Jonathan Powered, competition lawyer. Hope this conversation on the trade secret smear campaign was helpful. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.